All right, hey guys, what's going on? So today we're gonna finally be getting into Feynman diagrams. It's been, I think we're at video 60 or something like that. I haven't uh, actually checked yet. But uh, here we are, we're at Feynman diagrams. We're gonna take a look at what these Fe Feynman diagrams are a little bit more in depth now. I've talked about them in the past, but we're gonna take a look at what they are. We're gonna take a look at what the Feynman rules are and how they're gonna help and how exactly these Feynman rules are gonna sort of coalesce with the previous calculations um, we've been working on when calculating scattering amplitudes. And hopefully this will put a few more things into perspective. And uh, with that being said, let's get straight into the material. So we are talking about Feynman diagrams today. And from here on out, we're going to be talking, we're going to be using these to our advantage heavily. Uh, so Feynman, as you know, Richard Feynman was a theoretical physicist. And he came up with these diagrams as a way to circumvent everything that we've been doing so far, <laughs> right? So what we've been doing so far is we, we've said, okay, we want to calculate a scattering amplitude. And that scattering amplitude uh, looked like this. So we want, to, we want to know exactly what the amplitude associated with this kind of conversion looked like, or this kind of process looked like. And we said, we had a, a zeroth order approximation. We said we had a first order, we're saying we have a second order. And this approximation continues out n times, or an infinite number of times. And as we continue out an infinite number of times, we get, high, we get more um, higher degrees of uh, resolution, if you will, as to uh, regarding how detailed we want to describe our scattering processes. And so what did Feynman do here? So, so, so what we've been doing, so, so before, I, before I go into Feynman, what, so what we've been doing is we've been saying, in order to calculate these, we've had to reach into our bag of contractions, we've had to reach into our bag of Wick's theorem, we've had to uh, take all these mathematical tricks and and use Wick, we've, we, so we've basically, we went from Wick's theorem, we used contractions, and then from the contractions, we put them back, we, from the contractions, we put those back into our uh, approximation uh, form, right? And then from our approximation, we derived a, a, um, a function that describes what was going on with that second degree term. So what Feynman's going to do here, Feynman is going to say, scratch all that. We're going to draw diagrams here. Okay, we're going to draw diagrams so that we can make sense of what's going on. Okay. So what do these diagrams look like? Well, the first order di this first order term is going to be a term that looks like this, where we have two incoming particles not interacting at all. Okay. These two interacting particles, not interacting at all, are going to become two outgoing particles. Okay, there's no interaction at all between these two things. Another diagram that in which something like this could happen is something like this, right? So, let's so we have incoming particle one and two, and they end up at different locations in space time, right? If we can imagine, these are on a diagram of space time, right? So, with time being here and space being here, they end up at different points in space, or at different points in time, essentially, and space. Uh, but they, they've somehow crossed each other, but they didn't interact, right? So you can, so uh, one way of thinking about that is them being not at, not within the same plane, say, right? So they're not, the, the two particles are not in the same plane, but so they're able to cross each other without interaction. Right, they're able to cross each other without interacting with with each other. Right, so that's not too uh, inconceivable to think about. Uh, two particles ending up at two different uh, space time points, being, um, and so and not interacting at all. Right. So that so this hump right here just depicts that non interaction. Right. Okay. And then we have our first order term. So our first order term looks like this. And the, the order of the term, right? So when we say first order, second order, zeroth order, and so forth. Zeroth order is where there's no 
uh, where, where there's no vertex, right? So there's no point of of uh, of a proximity between the two particles so that they can interact. Here, there is the there is a vertex, so their paths do cross, right? They do interact at a point. That's the first order term. So the order corresponds to how many vertices. And that, that's a key point here. The order corresponds to vertices. And I'm actually going to write that down. All right, so order and vert vertices. Order number of vertices. I don't know if I spell vertices right. But this is a key point here. This right here is something to ingrain into your brains because uh, each term here, each term here, so the first order term corresponds to the, all the terms or all the diagrams in which the particles could only interact once, okay? The second order term corresponds to a di diagrams that might look like this, right? So these are, these are diagrams that describe particles that interact twice. Okay, so interaction, interaction, and then outgoing. An nth order term, okay, I'm going to try to draw an nth order term. Something that might look like this. Oh. All right, so what is this? We have an interaction here, we have an interaction here, we have an interaction here, and an interaction here. So an nth, this is a term in which n equals one, two, three, four terms, right? So that is a potential Feynman diagram in which n uh, equals four, in, in which uh, there's four interactions, or this is a fourth order approximation. Okay, I'm gonna erase that because that looks really ugly, but we get the point now, right? So the order of the approximation that we're calculating is equal to the number of vertices in the Feynman diagram. Here's another example of what a second order term might look like. Okay. All right. So what does this all mean? So let's put this, let's think of this as, okay. So we, we drew this last time, a few videos ago, where we had a two particles, two incoming particles, black box of interaction. We don't, we have no idea what's happening between these two particles. We're not making it really any assumptions at this point. And then we have two outgoing particles. Okay. So we're going to approximate what we want to, we want to approximate this amplitude. And two, the way we approximate this amplitude is by saying we add up all the zeroth order terms. So that'd be these two terms. Then we add up all the possible, uh, all of the possible first order terms. So this is the point of only one interaction. And then we add up all of the second order terms and so forth. Okay, how is this actually helping us in, for calculations? All right, so you might ask that question. How exactly is that this diagrammatic way of thinking about amplitude calculation. How is this helping us? Well, the way it's going to help us is we're going to look, we're going to come here now, and I'm going to move this down a little bit. These are what are called the Feynman rules. F Feynman rules. Specifically, for the model, the five four model, or the fourth power model. Right, we're gonna find out though that the rules are really not that different for more generalized models, okay? And we'll, we'll see that later on. But we're gonna say, okay, we, we had all those contractions right, in our calculations before. We're gonna say the contractions that look like this are going to be given a factor of this, okay? And we've calculated this before. This was an important contraction that we've seen before. This contraction is going to be associated 
with incoming external lines. So let's look at a, a diagram again. Let's take a look at this diagram right here. So these two guys right here are going to be given this factor of e to the i k x and e to the i k x minus i k x, right? So these are two particles that have momentum k, so we could say k1 and k2, and they're going to be given this exponential term, okay? That's the incoming external lines. The outgoing external lines, just gonna, they're just going to have an opposite sign on the exponent. So e to the i k3x and e to the i k4x. That's these guys right here, okay? And then, okay, so this one, so internal lines, so this is the Feynman propagator. Now we don't have an internal line in this diagram, but the in this diagram here, but we do have internal lines here, right? So this internal line here and this internal line here, these are going to be given D, F, K, Y, right? So this is not K, X, this is X, this is space time point X and this is space time point Y. And we're ta the, this term as a propagator, again, we, when we've talked about pro pro propagators in the past, we've talked about how they take in two points at space time and they compare the two points or they calculate what the amplitude is going to be for a particle to travel between this point and the next point. And the further the points are from each other, that amplitude decreases exponentially. We've seen that before. Okay. And that's so that this is the Feynman propagator, and that's going to be associated with an internal line in the Feynman diagrams. And then last and not least, we have this term. And this, I say not least, for a very important reason. This guy right here is going to be a very important thing we want to talk about when we're talking about when we start talking about renormalization and stuff like this. This couple, this is a coupling constant essentially. This is a constant that's going to tell us uh, something about. Here we'll, we'll we'll go to the diagram here. So it's going to tell us something about what's going on, the degree of coupling. Here, I'll do that in a different color. The de degree of coupling between the two particles that interact with each other at that point, right? And then we have one here as well, right? And so we have our outgoing particles, which are these guys, and then our incoming particles, which are these guys. And with th this applies for all... Feynman diagrams, right? There's going to be some slight modifications when we get out of the uh, the phi four model, but very slight, right? The, the, these general rules are going to apply across the board um, with some slight modifications, and we'll we'll take a look at exactly what those slight modifications are later. But with all of this being said, we are now going to be able to calculate amplitudes just by looking at Feynman diagrams and starting calculations from those diagrams, not starting the calculations from writing out Wick's theorem and all this kind of stuff. And what we're gonna see is that Wick's theorem and Feynman diagrams, they're, they're exactly the same process, right? So the mathematical process of saying that contractions are, <clears throat> excuse me, of saying that contractions are the difference between the time order and the normal order product, that statement is the same thing as saying Feynman diagrams, right? So we've said all that. When we say Feynman diagrams, that is just, that's, that's a shorter sentence in and of itself, right? So this is, this is why uh, Feynman diagrams are going to be super, super useful uh, for calculations later on. So with that being said, I hope you guys like this kind of content, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.